you just keep coming to church just as you are, but the promise is you're not going to stay the way you are because the same God that delivered me is the same God that will deliver you. The same God that transformed me is going to transform you. The same God that changed me is going to change you. The same God that healed me is going to heal you. I want to minister this one thought to you today, and I just simply want to title it, Ready, Set, Go. And I want you to know if you are a, a runner, then you're familiar when you're in the blocks when they say, Ready, Set, Go. If you're a swimmer on the blocks, you're familiar with the Ready, Set, Go. Notice what it doesn't say, Ready, Set, Stop, Ready, Set, Delay. Ready, set, hesitate. It says, ready, set, go. It's amazing in the name of God, there is G-O in the name of God. It's amazing in the word gospel, there is go to the gospel. I want to challenge you today why go is so important. And I'm going to let the scriptures begin to drive this thought to you today. Now, I may be a little long in the scriptures, but I want you to get this point today of what the Bible is trying to emphasize. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles. Matthew 28, and Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Mark 16, and he, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. How many of you know God is emphasizing a go? Now, I have a little object over here that I'd like to show you a little bit about what that looks like. How many of you know there's a difference between what this is? This means stop. Good, good job, little kids. How many of you know what this means? That means go. How many of you know what green light means and what red light means? So what does green light mean? And what does red light mean? Good job. You guys get a gold star today. You know, the problem is, is that God is saying this and we're doing this. Why is there such a problem when God says that you and I are to go into all the world? Now, that may not be a world that you're familiar with. That may not be a world you like. That may not be people in that world that you can identify with. But you're to go into all worlds, whether that's an athletic world, an entertainment world, a politician world, a business world, whatever world that is, he's saying there are lost people there. And if you don't go, those lost people may never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to walk this earth again. I came to this earth with a mission. And I fulfilled that mission on Calvary's cross to die for mankind's sin. Now I need you to walk as representatives of me, as messengers of me, as ambassadors of me. And I need you to do what I would do. And so I want you to see the emphasis that God says when he says to go, to go. You know, if we go up north, there's this place called Hertz Castle. It's the William Randolph Hearst estate. Many of you maybe have gone up there and you see this elaborate multi-million, probably now worth billions of artifacts that are up there and how this individual lived. 
And you could be a guest of William Randolph Hearst, and you could stay on the ranch, and you can enjoy the animals, you could enjoy the movie theater, you could enjoy the pools, you could enjoy the games, everything that he had. He only had one request of his guests that you were to join him at an evening dinner. The rest of the day, you could do whatever you chose to want to do. Now, when you came to the dinner at the evening to have dinner with him, he was a gentleman. He never asked you to leave. He would never ask you to go. You could literally stay there as long as you want. You say, man, that's a pretty good spread here. I get served meals. I get to swim in the pool. I get to live in this little casita. He will never ask you to leave. How many of you know you're not like that? You will ask people to leave, especially relatives that have been with you too long. So here's how he would tell you to leave without asking you to leave. He had this giant dinner table where people ate dinner together. And the closer you sat to him at the dinner table was a sign you are welcomed, you are loved, you are my friend. The further you got away from the end of the table, it was him telling you, you've outstayed your welcome, get to be kicking, don't let the door hit you on the way behind, go, go. See, William Randolph Hearst in the greatest state was only to be there to, it was temporary. It was there to just be enjoyed for a moment. And so it is in the kingdom of God as we apply it. Church is good, but you got to get going. This earth is great, but you're going to get going one day. And we've got to be about our father's business. And so when God says that you and I are to go, he is telling us not to hesitate and not to procrastinate, not to get fearful and not get busy or not get distracted. We need to go because Jesus is asking us to go. We need to go because people are waiting for us. We need to get going because time is short. We need to get going because the world is not getting any better. We need to get going because the devil is more active than he's ever been before. We need to get going because there is a heaven and there is a hell. We need to get going. There's a statement that says, if the church doesn't evangelize, it will start fossilizing. You show me a Christian that's gossiping all the time, not in this church, but in other churches. You show me a Christian who's complaining all the time. You show me a Christian who's disgruntled all the time, and I'll show you someone who doesn't win souls into the kingdom of God. You show me a church that is dying. That every week begins to lose numbers, I'll show you a church that's not winning souls into the kingdom of God. My greatest fear is not what exists today. Today we have a sanctuary filled with thousands of people. My concern is what this church is going to look like tomorrow. Because eventually I'm going to get old and you're going to get old and you're going to die. The life of the church needs to continue to exist. And the way that it continues to exist is souls are being saved. Witnessing is taking place. We are inviting people into the kingdom of God. We are sharing our testimony. There is the sounds and signs of babies, spiritual babies, being born into the kingdom of God. When you have baby sounds, you're alive, you're excited. Excited. You see, I've raised three sons, and they, they moved out, and uh, the, the house is very, very quiet because there's two old people that live there. <laughs> and it's very, very quiet, and the older you get, you talk less and less to each other. It's all now through facial expressions and <laughs> moans and groans. <laughs> you say, I don't receive that preacher in the name of Jesus. Well, that's all... You have your set little routine. How many of you know you go to the market at the same time? You sit and watch TV at the same time. You, you have your little set routine. Well, not too long ago, my youngest son, Adam, and his wife, Ashley, came to live with us temporarily until they save money because they want to buy a, a bigger home. Well, they just recently had a baby. And, and Matthias now is in our lives. And Matthias cries. And Matthias makes noise. But it's such a wonderful sound in our home to hear the sounds of a baby. 
Everyone smiles. It brings laughter. It brings, you know, a lightheartedness. It brings excitement. And so it is in a Christian's life. If there is not the sounds of birthing and babies going on and burping going on and pooping going on, then you're getting too old. You're getting too old as a Christian. You're too old. Let me give you another sign that you're getting old. As a woman's body begins to mature, she ages. And there comes a point in her life where she cannot bear children anymore. So to speak, her reproductive organs begin to die. She cannot give birth anymore. And so it is in the kingdom of God. We have too many churches, too many Christians that are not reproducing anymore. There's a death that is taking place in their lives. And Jesus' last words, the very last words, he, said, he could have said, go be successful. Go marry right. Go have a lot of children. Go big, a, big, a, build a big business. But he said his last very words to us ought to be our first words that we live by every day. His last words ought to be our first priority, our first mandate, our first mission, our first message, our first ministry. His last words were to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hey, everyone. We want to thank you for watching Real with Diego. If you would like weekly updates on upcoming episodes, then please visit and like our Facebook page. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You know, without each and every one of you, this show wouldn't be where it is today. We couldn't do it without you. So make sure you like, repost, and share. We want to stay connected with you because why? The more sharing, the better. We really want to hear from you, so don't hesitate to message us as well. And if you're ever in the Inland Empire, then please come and visit us. We would love to meet you. But just do one simple thing for us. Come as you are. So I want to share with you very quickly just some points here uh, that represents go and why you and I need to be going. Nothing is going to happen until we go. Nothing is going to happen until we go. Uh, turn over to Luke, the 14th chapter. Nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to be different. Everything is going to be the same. There are not going to be any new stories, new testimonies, new, new, uh, any new miracles of deliverance of people's lives being changed if people don't go. Nothing's going to happen until we go. I want you to look at Luke 14 and watch what it says here in verse number 16, then he said to them, a certain man gave a great supper and he invited many. And his servant said at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. We need to get all the excuses out of our lives for not inviting people. Well, we need to get all the excuses out of our lives for not accepting Christ's invitation to come to his party. It says, and the first said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. You may underline the word ground. Ground represents possessions and pleasures that often keep people from serving God or seeking God. He goes on and he says, another said, I have bought five oxen and I have not to, excuse me, I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. The second word for oxen is it's amazing how people let business and job rob them from serving God. And the third excuse, he said, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. The third excuse people have is relationships. Whether that's my kids, whether that's who I married, whether that's my family. Three stoppages that people have. Then his master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, watch this, go out. Go now. And go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes, into the city. And I want you to bring in. I want you to bring in some poor people and some main people and some lame people and some blind people. First, you went after people that have a job. This time, I don't want you to go after people that had a job. The first time you went after people that own land. This time, I don't want you to go after people that own land. Last time, you went after people that are married. I want you to go to a different classification, people that you overlooked the first time. This time, I want you to go look for some lame people. How many of you know some lame people? They're sitting next to you right now. How many of you know some lame people? My, blind people. 
He says sick people, lame people, and blind people. And he goes on, he says, and the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is more room. There's always room for one more person to come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's always room in our hearts never to separate from someone that's lost. There's still room there. He goes on, then the master said to the servant, go out. Go out again. God, I'm tired. God, I used to do that evangelism stuff and soul winning stuff in the 1970s when I first got saved. God said, no, you go out and now. Now I want you to go places you've never been before. This time I want you to go to highways and I want you to go to hedges. And he said, I want you to do something that you didn't do before. You didn't do this with the maim, and you didn't do this with the lame, and you didn't do this with the blind, nor the sick. And you did not do this with those that own the oxen and those that own the land and to the married couple. This time I want you to use a system called compelling people. Compel them. Compel them. How many of you ever been compelled to eat? Look at somebody next to you and say, don't lie. How many of you have ever been compelled to go to the bathroom and would not be denied, would not be stopped? You will knock a person over. <laughs> he uses such a strong word of emotion, impulse, urge that will not be stopped nor denied when it comes to soul winning and witnessing. I want to challenge you. I don't often feel compelled. If it fits into my schedule and it's a convenient time and I feel compelled this compelling I think comes from the Holy Spirit and any of us that are Christ followers know when the Spirit of God is coming upon you he's compelling you and he's setting this and orchestrating this moment up where all of a sudden out of the blue there's an urgency to talk to a person or they're opening their heart to you he said this time I want you to compel them to come in and I love this phrase that my house may be filled. What is God's obsession with his house being filled? See, here's what Jesus would. If Jesus would show up today, he'd acknowledge you, and then what Jesus would do is look at all the empty seats. See, we want him to focus just on us. He wouldn't focus just on us. He'd be focused on, he'd be focusing on who's not here today. He'd be grateful to you, and he ministered to you, but he'd be focused on who should have been here today. Who are all the people we passed on by? Who are all the people maybe we didn't invite? Who are all the people that should be here today? He always wants his house to be filled. Why would God give us a 4,000 seat auditorium if not every seat should be filled? Then did Jesus make a mistake? Every church in the world ought to be filled. And God wants his house. He wants heaven. He wants eternity filled with lost, undeserving, broken, messed up, jacked up people who have received the forgiveness of Christ and only through Christ can be made whole. So the thought is this, nothing's going to happen until we go. Nothing is going to, everything in your life is going to be safe and comfortable and programmed, programmed, calendar scheduled if you don't go. Nothing is going to change. You will not hear someone cry on your shoulder. You'll not hear someone look at you and say, thank you. Nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change until we go. Hey, I want to personally invite you to our church. There are a lot of great churches, and I want you to experience any Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. I think our church is the greatest. If you're ever in the area, I want to personally invite you to our church. We welcome anybody and everybody. If you're tall or if you're short, or you got a great education, or you don't have an education, it doesn't matter your skin color, it doesn't matter the diversity of your life, it doesn't matter if you like Starbucks or you hate Starbucks, I want to personally invite you. If you come, come and say hello. Let us know that you watch us on Real, and I appreciate you sharing this television program with a lot of people. God bless. I want to end with this story, and the story is that when I grew up, and everybody has somebody like this in their neighborhood, it was Mrs. Easley. 
Mrs. Easley was about as old as Methuselah or dirt. She was just old, really old. And, uh, and for a little kid, it was very scary. It's very scary because you hardly ever see her. And if you do, you see a silhouette through a window of her. And so there was the legend of Mrs. Easley that she used to kidnap kids and that she'd burn them in the fire and the smoke would go through the chimney and all the kids would tell the story of Mrs. Easley. Her house looked like somewhere between the Munster house and the Adams family house. It was broken down, the paint was chipped, the weeds grew up. Well, in my neighborhood, there come times in my life as a little boy where I'd have to sell candy, let's just say for Pop Warner football or Little League baseball, and i knock on every door to sell candy except Mrs. Easley's. I would not sell candy to her. I delivered the Herald Examiner, and so I'd try to get subscriptions from the newspaper. I knocked on every door in my neighborhood except Mrs. Easley. I was a Catholic, and so as a little Catholic boy, you had a little magazine called Good Tidings that you sold at the door, and I tried to sell that, but I would never sell it to Mrs. East. I had a little, little lawnmower business uh, with a push lawnmower, and young people don't even know what a push lawnmower is, but, but I'd, I'd show up with my push lawnmower. Look, Google, Google push lawnmower. <laughs> they don't go like this. They don't go like that, and they don't say... It. So I'd go around the neighbor. I never knocked on Mrs. Easley's door. How do I know that Mrs. Easley did not want my candy or newspaper or good tidings or her lawnmower? See, it was in my mind of fear or judgment that stopped me from having a relationship with Mrs. Easley. There are many Mrs. Easley's in our lives that really make us uncomfortable. I don't like your past. I don't like your lifestyle. I don't like how you dress. I don't like how you talk. I don't like what your, you know, your, your prison record says. I don't like it. So you're not worthy of the gospel. I was not worthy of the gospel. I'm done. There's my final thought. I want to talk to you about Diego Mesa. Diego today. Diego's pretty good at a, a lot of things. Let me just boast for a minute. Diego is very athletic. I'm very good at athlete, as, as an athlete, especially endurance stuff. I'm very good at it. I'm very good at eating right. P people are amazed at my diet. I'm really good at eating right. I'm really good at pretty good at being a husband and I'm pretty good at being a father and I'm trying to be really good at being a granddaddy last four days me and Cindy were do our annual pilgrimage with our grandkids we take them in San Diego we spend time with them we talk to them it's very important for me to be good at that I'm pretty good at praying I could close my eyes and I can tap into the spirit I'm pretty good at reading the Bible but you know what I'm not good at? I'm not good at soul winning. And I pride myself in these other areas of my life, but I don't seem to have a pride or a concern when it comes to getting better as a soul winner. But I'm here to tell you, it's something I pray almost every day of my life. God, make me a better soul winner. Because Jesus, you are the best soul winner that walked the planet. And sinners love to hang around you. And there was something that was so attractive about your life. Teach me how to be a good soul winner. You know, everything in life is about preparation. We prepare to go on vacation. We prepare to go to dinner. Uh, we prepare for holidays. We prepare for special events like anniversaries or birthdays. We prepare to buy a house. We prepare to buy a car. Preparation is a huge part of what we do. We prepare our clothes on how we're going to dress that day. Have you ever thought about preparing for eternity? See, eternity, how long is eternity? Eternity is like forever. <laughs> it's forever and forever and forever. You know, sometimes days 
uh, just drag on. And then sometimes days go really fast. Here's this place called eternity that is forever and forever and forever. It's far greater than a hundred years or a thousand years or a million years or a billion years or a trillion years. It goes on and on and on and on. It's amazing to me how many of us have never thought about, we know it's gonna happen, we know it exists, but we make no preparation. We are prepared for tragedies. Uh, we prepare for earthquakes. We prepare for tornadoes. We prepare for retirements. We prepare to get old. But we don't, we even prepare to die with funeral arrangements. But we've made no preparation for eternity. And the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that is judgment. We stand before God. We need to make preparation for what's gonna happen the second, the millisecond after we die. Preparation for eternity starts with this. It's like a door. You have to walk through that door. And as you and I walk through that door, the thing that's going to prepare us and set us and guarantee that our eternal existence will be everything that we want and everything we expect is Jesus. Jesus is that door to eternal life. Today, if you're not sure, nor have you made preparation for eternity, it's based upon a wish, it's based upon a doubt, or it's based upon a denial. Maybe it's based on ignorance, or maybe it's based on arrogance. I want you to get this right, because there's too much to risk. Eternity is forever. And the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life, eternal life. So today, if you're ready to make eternal preparation, I want you to invite Jesus in your heart. I want you to recognize you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We all fall short of the glory of God. And only Jesus can forgive us of our sins. So just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And now I want to live for you for the rest of my life. Thank you that eternity is now within my heart and I will see you for eternity and forever be with you. Hey, God bless. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you real soon. Hey, guys, we want to build a relationship with you. If you have any questions or simply just want to reach out, let us know how you feel. Please message us, or you can visit our Facebook page, leave a comment, or even send a video if you like. However you want to share your life, it's cool. Just be sure to do one simple thing, come as you are. Hey, thank you for watching. If you're ever in the SoCal, Southern California, LA area, we wanna invite you to physically come and be with us. We have a great viewing audience. We have a live streaming audience. We have a Facebook audience. But I'd love to be able to shake your hand, be introduced. So if you're ever in the area, come to one of our many services. But most of all, come up to me because we get really encouraged when we meet our television audience.